Hey Data Junkies, welcome back. We're here for another episode of Multiple Linear Regression with Sean Jansen, your host, and this time we're going into topic 13.6, on model selection. Model selection is the topic where now that you know how to run multiple linear regression and you can take variables in and out and we can tinker around with it in different ways, now we get to consider the idea, well what if I have different multiple regression models, which one do I choose? Which ones are performing the best? How do I know which one is the one I should be using moving forward? How can I compare them to each other? So in this case, let's go ahead and start talking about model selection, and we're not talking about the Instagram type. Now, I don't often read slides to you, and I don't often take these sort of high-level approaches, but I think in this case, I'm going to take a moment, and we're going to read a couple quotes together, because I think there's a few things here that are just really good for us to kind of think about and chew on and digest when we're considering model selection. The first comes from someone named George Box, who was an amazing statistician that really helped advance our field in a variety of areas. And he said in one of his books that all models are approximations. Essentially, all models are wrong, but some are useful. He later says, remember that all models are wrong. The practical question is, how wrong do they have to be to not be useful? So this is some really deep sort of thinking here that you know, it doesn't really matter what variables you're using, what you're trying to measure as an outcome, the way these things are constructed, if perchance that we take into this idea that no matter how it's built, it's never going to be completely right. It's never going to completely model and explain 100% of why something happens. And so what we're trying to do is get our best guess idea, our best guess understanding. And so we really have to understand that we're putting in a lot of assumptions, a lot of ideas that we say, well, we need to be uh, meeting these constraints and we have to have these rules and put in these things on us when real life doesn't always work like that. And so we are constraining ourselves artificially some, to some point in order to make things work. And the next one's going to come from somebody named Peter Truman. Hopefully I said his name right here. And if I have this correctly, he tended to work in more of the biomedical side of the analytics and research here. And more recently, in the past several years, he's been writing onto the sort of larger concepts of research and philosophies of science more broadly. And he goes ahead and tells us that seemingly incompatible models may be used to make predictions about the same phenomena. For each model, we may believe that its predictive power is at least an indication of its being at least approximately true. But if both models are successful in making predictions and yet mutually inconsistent, how can they both be true? Two observers are looking at a physical object. One may report seeing a circular disk. The other may report seeing a rectangle. Both will be correct, but both will be looking at the object, a cylindrical can, from above and the other will be observing from the side. The two models may represent different aspects of the same reality. Again, this is some sort of deep fundamental thinking here that when we're building out these models and whether you've gone out and collected the data, that means you have had certain ways of thinking and measurement and potential biases and just the way of your approach in general, even if you didn't mean to have a specific bias, you may have a, a, a particular way in which things are constructed or the way others may have done this as well or how you've taken what's already been measured and you may be working with the data, massaging it, transforming it, or even taking it raw, how it works into the model. And you may have someone else who takes the very same data or similar collections and comes up with these different sorts of ideas and results. So whenever you're building these models and you're selecting through these models, always trying to keep a broader understanding of where did it come from? How are you thinking about it? How are you working with it, right? Because not all models are correct. Some of them can be useful and they may have different points of view. So having said all that, we can ask ourselves, well, how do I know if my model is good? Or as Box would say, useful, right? Well, what we have to understand what is good. Does it mean that you have this sort of large predictive power, that you've got big coefficients, so every unit change is going to have some meaningful impacts in your dependent variable? But what if I had to have issues where maybe I had multicollinearity and so I had to drop interesting variables in order to make things work? Is it still a good model, right? Some of you are going to be saying, 
Well, Professor, just give me a number. Just give me something that tells me if I'm bigger than this or smaller than this, then I've got a good model. Unfortunately, I don't have that for you. A lot of it depends on context. A lot of it's going to depend on the ranges of the measures and the, how the data is structured than which you are working with. And so we need to take these on a case by case basis. Now we start with the assumptions. That's the, that is the fundamental level. And in the slides you're going to receive with this video, I just have some extra recap slides to kind of go over the assumptions again, but I'm going to skip them in the video component for now because you have a whole separate video you can check back to on the assumptions. And I don't want to make this a much longer video than it necessarily has to be. Now, after you go through your assumptions and you said, all right, I've passed all of my assumptions that I need to pass. Where am I standing now? Well, we need to consider something called the Goldilocks zone, which I'll come back to in just a moment. And when you're going with these Goldilocks zone types of approaches, we have some measures that can help us get an understanding. It's not exactly that single number line in the sand that says I have or I don't have a good model. But instead, what we can do is use these as comparatives with each other, against other models, to see how well it is that we are doing. And the three that we're going to talk about primarily in this video, I'm going to mention a few others, but the three primary ones of focus are R squared, your F test, and what we call the RSE. So let's go ahead and jump forward on some of these things and talk about the Goldilocks zone. So the Goldilocks zone comes from that story. If you've ever heard of Goldilocks and the three bears, it has some historical roots that go farther beyond that. But essentially, this little girl comes into these bears' lives for better or for worse, and she's understanding of what are the things in their home, with, where they sleep, and their food that they eat to find out what's too hot, too cold, too lumpy, too soft, and there's something in the middle that's just right. Those of you that are into the astronomical and space sciences, you may have heard of Goldilocks zone in reference to planets that could be potentially habitable for life. They're not too hot, they're not too cold, and they have certain characteristics about them that may make life more conducive for its existence. So that's what we're talking about in the Goldilocks zone, that there's some sort of sweet spot in the middle. When we bridge this to the world of statistics and data analytics in general, we're talking about something being a model that's too few is an underspecified model. These are talking about models that don't have enough predictors because you don't have enough predictors. Your estimates could be biased because there's certain things going on in your errors that are non-random and are going to give you that are going to give you biased estimates. So you have an underspecified model with too few predictors. Overspecified models, on the other hand, may have too many predictors. You have run out your degrees of freedom, and the model is then overspecified. In this case, you will have less precise estimates. Right? The, the coefficients may be good, but your standard errors might be off. Now, keep in mind as well that you, depending if you're going into the data sciences, you may also hear overspecified being in reference to if you've hyper-trained your regression model. You have some sort of data that you are using as a training data in which to say, can I get the best regression model I can to predict certain values in my training data? And you are going to fine tune it like a, like a race car. And you're going to tweak all of the performance aspects of it. And then you're going to take that race car out onto the regular streets where the real world data is at. And your race car is not going to do as well as a regular car might on the streets because it's been hyper tuned for a racetrack. So you have these sorts of differences when you get into the data sciences with terms like overspecified, but they're getting to similar ideas and concepts. This idea of being just right is a model that's going to have the right amount of predictor variables. It's not going to have bias. It's going to be precise. And you're going to say, well, how do I get to that point? Well, the main areas in which we deal with this are, first of all, start with theory. What is it you're supposed to have? The other night I was in a classroom and we were talking about predicting aspects of cancer. And we had a lot of different aspects. And one of the variables was, do they smoke? And we're like, well, what does smoking have anything to do with cancer? Of course, you know, we have this understanding that smoking has varying effects with carcinogens and other things that we now know lead to cancer. But many years ago, we didn't necessarily have those theories in which to build upon. So those that have come before us and those that have thought of these large pictures and tested things out, we need to stand on the shoulders of those giants to move forward with what we have. And theory can come from research. It can come from the community of those 
that you're working with, colleagues that have these different ideas. And so we need to think and chew about these ideas, these concepts when we put them forward into our regression model. We need to weigh the matter of simple versus complex. Having a couple predictor variables, having a hundred predictor variables, we're probably going to be somewhere in between. And then also, always, always, always check your residual plots. Check those assumptions. Make sure your model's healthy and doing okay. So let's talk then about one of the first numbers we were referring to, the F statistic or the overall F. Just as a brief recap, the F statistic was a ratio of, in the numerator, how well your model does having predictor variables. Does having predictor variables in your model help your model do better with its y hats, with its predictive capacity? In the denominator, it's saying, well, how well does it do with an intercept only model? No predictors at all. And it takes a ratio of that. That ratio then is your F score, which we can map out to an F distribution. And the higher the F score, the more likely it's going to be significantly different from the null of saying, I can do well with an intercept only model, right? I can do well with just a Y hat at the mean of the dependent variable. So we can use that as sort of a rough gauge for prediction and hypothesis testing. It's not super accurate in terms of being able to compare them across different models, but you can use it if you're just kind of adding in and out within your one little regression model there. And the F test is going to help you validate your R squared. Now your R squared, let's just briefly recap on what that's looking like. So the R squared is the difference of the improvement in your model. What we're talking about is how much of the variance of your dependent variable is accounted for, explained by your independent variables, right? So how much work are your independent variables doing to help understand the variation in R squared? Asterisk and footnote that we're always talking about how much this is being a shared variance. It's not necessarily causal variance here. Just anecdote here. So when we're dealing with R squared, it's the amount of the variation in the numerator that is being accounted for, being divided by a denominator of how much total variance you have, and that's your R squared. All right. Now, R squared, it has some benefits. It has some quirks. Let's talk about these. So R squared, it's a fantastic number because as people, it's in a format we readily understand. It goes from zero to one, so we can talk about it as a proportion or multiply it by 100 to get a percentage. We think very well in percentages. It, so it's easy also to generate mathematically in multiple linear regression. We can compare it against different models and say, how is your R squared? How is your R squared? Doing pretty good. Right? And we have this general understanding that the larger your R squared goes, the better your model is doing at this idea of explained variation. So what's not to love? It sounds like we have a win-win scenario. Well, R squared has this dirty little secret. It has artificial inflation problems. The more independent variables you put into your model, R squared is going to keep going up. That's just simply how the math is designed to work. Unfortunately, not every predictor variable you put into your model is going to be doing a good amount of work. Sometimes it could do very little. Sometimes it could actually detract. So let's introduce R squared sibling here, adjusted R squared. Now adjusted R squared, the entire purpose for it is to counterbalance out R squared and say, you know what? I understand you have this little issue with artificial inflation. Let me kind of step in and take care of that, okay? Let me mitigate this using a concept with degrees of freedom here. And so I'm only going to increase, the adjusted R squared is only going to go up when you have good predictors in your model, when you have variables that are actually doing work to explain the variation. And R squared, rather adjusted R squared, can penalize the regular R squared if it has poor predictors. How does it do this? Well, we have a, a fix onto the R squared functions here. So in order to calculate adjusted R squared, I have a formula up here for you on the screen. I'm not going to read it out because it sounds a little clunky when you just put it into words. But it has on the rightmost side an adjustment factor that takes into account both the sample size in your model and the number of predictor variables you have. And Based on these two values, they are going to work against R squared to adjust its 
actual value. Now, because it's going to go ahead and adjust this based on the number of predictor values, then we need to say, well, which one do I use? R squared or adjusted R squared? Well, adjusted is going to be the way to go because it's already countermanding this balance. Now, if you happen to have situations in which all of the predictors you have, they're good predictors, they're not slouchful, hanging on your couch, bad predictors that are going to lower your R squared, then yeah, you can go ahead and reference the multiple because adjusted and multiple should be equivalent to each other. There shouldn't be much difference between them. But if there is difference, adjusted is going to be the way to go with this, okay? Now, when you're talking about adjusted R squared, it's good about talking about your model overall, how well you can fit your prediction as the overall, but what about the relationship between your variables as well? So let's bring another contender into the ring. We have F, we have R, in comes RSE. RSE stands for Residual Standard Error. And the purpose of Residual Standard Error, the uh, functional definition, if you will, is it is the standard deviation of our residuals. The residuals are that unexplained variance, that, that, I'm sorry, that unexplained amount of error, the things that we haven't been able to account for in the model. And this is the standard deviation of it. And I said in this course, we're not going to exactly quantify the errors. We could, but we're not. And from those, the RSE tells us the standard deviation of that number we haven't computed. Now, because RSE is a standard deviation of this metric here, it also serves as a goodness of fit. And because it's working as this goodness of fit, we're going to say that the smaller your standard deviations, the better your model's doing. Keep in mind what standard deviations are doing. We have these curves. You can think you've got this sort of you know, peaked curve here. And when standard deviation is big, your curves are wider and flatter. And when standard deviation is smaller, your curves are taller and thinner, right? And you still have the same percentage of 95, 68, 99% inside those, or underneath those curves rather, according to the empirical rule. But when their standard deviations are smaller, and therefore your distributions of them are more thin and tall, then that 68, 95, 99% of where you have plus one, plus two, plus three, et cetera, standard deviations, then uh, you're going to have them closer to zero. Closer to zero means that they're going to be closer towards that regression line where there was a zero residual. So you're going to be having a better fit model. Now, taking a brief look at just a regression output here in R. In this case, the screenshot you're looking at happens to be using the FIFA data set where we are predicting some footballers rating, how well they perform in the leagues. And we have four predictor variables here. And note down in the bottom section where your model information is at, we have residual standard error. And in residual standard error, that's what we're talking about. That's the RSE. It's been there all along. I just didn't tell you about it. Surprise. So in this particular case, we have an RSE of 5.37. 5.37 is the standard deviation of our residuals. All right. Now we can go ahead and if we run this model again, and let's say we add in another variable, the RSE is going to change. It could go up, it could stay the same, or it could go down. We want it to go down if our model is improving. So if you want to use this as a model selection criteria, lower RSCs are better. Now keep in mind, we can compare this when we are doing these sorts of put in some predictors, take out some predictors, check our models against each other. We can't use this to compare, let's say, this model where we're looking at FIFA ratings and another model, maybe where we're looking at FIFA kicking ability or even some completely different where we're looking at spending on sciences or something, right? Because the values in which that are going to be measured on these dependent variables that are generating our residuals could be on completely different scales. And therefore, the standard deviation values that they're coming from are going to be completely different from each other, okay?